I do believe I am live. Yes, I'm live on Facebook. So let me alert my group. I've got uh, my group now. Uh, I gotta let my group know that I'm live. Okay. Good, good, good. All right. Give people a few minutes to get on. We're going to start on time right at 2.30. And um, as always, I've got uh, something I'm excited about singing. Something where the Spirit of God is going to show us some stuff. Let me say, let me hasten to say that that's why you need the prophetic in your life on a regular basis. You need the prophetic in your life on a regular basis so that you can hear what the Spirit of God is saying to you right now, today, in the moment, in the season, so you can get an understanding of what God wants you to do right now, today, in this time in your life, in this season, in this, what's happening in the country, all those conditions. That's why you need the prophetic. That's one of the main advantages of the prophetic that the Spirit of God will discern, the Spirit of God will know the will of the Father and the will of the Son, what you're supposed to be doing, given the season, the time, the climate, that's all stuff. That is something you could never discern on your own. You could never discern the times and the seasons and what's going on around you and inside of you apart from the Holy Ghost. That's why you need the prophetic, okay? Now, remember that the Bible, the word of God, is always the more sure word of prophecy. But like I've always taught you, you need to be strong in all three areas of word. You need to be strong in the written word of God, the Bible. You need to know the living word of God for yourself, Jesus. And Jesus is the Bible made flesh. And you need to know the prophetic word of God, which normally comes to the rhema word. You normally comes to the prophetic, the fresh breathe word. What is God saying right now? Because God is a person, not a set of rules. That's the difference between religion and relationship. Religious people think God is a set of rules. So I, I tick off all my boxes. I check off all my boxes and I'm fine. No, God's a person. You cannot assume that you know his will. You cannot assume you're doing what he wants. You can't assume any of that. You have to ask him. All right, it's 2.30, so we're going to jump on in. Uh, I do think there's some more people I'm going to let know. Thought they'd see on the Facebook group, but I'm going to let them know here. Prophetic Word is live now. And remember, when you come on the broadcast, if you come on late, uh, then always watch the video from the beginning so you can get everything that's said. Always watch from the get from the beginning so you can get everything that's said. Okay, somebody's on, that's good. Okay, just letting all my people know that I'm on. Okay. Okay, so let's say a word of prayer and we will jump right on in. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Father, for this time. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness. Thank you, Father, for your grace. Thank you, Father, for being the only one that understands us inside and out. Thank you, Father, for putting together every atom, every molecule of our spirits, our souls, and our bodies. Thank you for creating us in your image. And thank you for being the only one with intimate knowledge of us. I ask you right now, oh God, forgive me for any sin and fill me with the Holy Ghost and speak through me, oh God. I must de decrease so you must increase. It's about what you're trying to say to your people, oh God. So I, I get out of the way and I ask you to breathe through me, oh God. Speak through me. Let whatever you want said be said right now, oh God, <clears throat> that you might be glorified in all things. 
that your saints might be edified and the demons might be terrified, O oh God. And we'll be careful to give you the play, praise and the glory and signs and wonders and miracles shall follow this prophetic word, O oh God. Signs and wonders and miracles shall follow this word and all that receive it and operate in it. We thank you for it. We believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Today's live prophetic word is leap. Now, if you came on late when you watched the replay, watch the video from the beginning, because I just talked about, once again, the three levels of word and why you need the prophetic word in your life. What it is that it helps you discern. It helps you to understand what time it is. It helps you understand what season it is. It helps you understand what God wants you personally to do. What you don't want to do is to be caught running around trying to figure out what God wants you to do kind of after the fact. And sometimes that's how the saints get caught because they don't stay filled with the Holy Ghost and they don't stay flowing in the prophetic. Okay. The prophetic can also help you discern a situation. Like if something happened and you don't understand what happened and you don't understand why it happened, the Holy Ghost can tell you. <laughs> okay. So again, this is why you need the prophetic in your life. All right. Today's prophetic word is leap. There are quite a few scriptures uh, that I'm going to reference. And we're going to listen to what the Holy Spirit has to say. Okay. The first scripture that we're going to look at is we're going to look at Psalms, the book of Psalms, 1829. But I'm going to read the verses leading up to verse 29 because they're very important. And then there's more scripture to go over. So we're going to read from Psalm chapter 18. Psalms is right in the middle of the Bible. Okay. One of the top biggest books in the Bible, Psalm chapter 18. <clears throat> and the key verse is going to be verse 29, but I'm going to start at verse 1 and read down to it. Okay, I'm reading out of the King James Version. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Buckler is another word for shield. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even into his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. Wroth is another word for angry, very angry. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made dark, darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. At the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed, hailstones, and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them, and he shot out lightnings and discomfited them. Then the channels of waters were seen, and the foundations of the world were discovered at thy rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils. He went from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, and from them which hated me, for they were too strong for me. They prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands, hath he recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me, and I did not put away his statutes from me. I was also upright before him, and I kept myself from mine iniquity. Therefore has the Lord recompensed me according to his righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands and his eyesight. With the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. With an upright man, thou wilt show thyself upright. With the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure. And with the froward, thou wilt show thyself froward. For thou wilt save the afflicted people, but will bring down high looks. For thou wilt light my candle, the Lord my God will light my darkness. Here it he is, here's verse 29. For by thee I have run through a troop. And by my God, have I leaped over a wall. Today's prophetic word is leap. Now, why did I read all that? And why is all that important? Oh, here's my sister. Let me say, hey, sis. 
I'll tell you why. The reason all that was important was because <clears throat> I could exegete all that. I mean, we could spend all day just on any one of those verses. So I don't have to, time to go into all those verses. But this Psalm was written as a response by King David for his successful military campaigns and his victory over Saul. Uh, it's a very uh, dramatic story. If you know anything about the story of David and Saul, Saul was the first king over Israel when they switched from the prophets to a monarchy. God did not want them to switch. God wanted to continue to lead them through the prophets like he had since Moses. But they said they wanted a king. So they worried God and worried God and worried God until God said, fine. So if they switched to a monarchy is one of the worst mistakes they ever made. The first king was a king that they picked. And they picked him because he was tall and good looking and came from a good family. And he's, his name was Saul. He was double minded. He wanted a little bit of what God said and a little bit of what he said and a little bit of what the people said and a little bit of what the Lord said and a little bit of spirit and a little bit of flesh. God got sick of that because the Lord does not like double minded. It's the Lord wants you to make up your mind, be in or out. And he displaced Saul and took his kingdom and gave his kingdom to David. The second king of Israel was the king that God himself chose. So from the time that David was identified as Saul's successor, Saul hated him and loved him at the same time. Because remember, Saul ended up being cursed with schizophrenia in the last part of his life. So Saul was literally schizophrenic. So sometimes he loved David, sometimes he hated him. Sometimes he wanted him to play music to calm him down. And sometimes he tried to kill him. So Saul was, was definitely bipolar. You know how we say about bipolar stuff? Saul was definitely that. He was of two minds because God cursed him. Remember, I always taught you that whatever you choose, God going to lock you in it. And if you choose to be double-minded with the Lord, be back and forth like that, God going to lock you in it. And he cursed King Saul with a spirit of schizophrenia. So David wrote this psalm after successful military campaigns against his enemies and after escaping from the hand of Saul. Some suggest that he wrote this after Saul died because Saul ended up uh, died in all of his family, except Mephibosheth, got wiped out. So God wiped out his entire bloodline and transferred everything he was going to do for Saul to King David. King David also was an excellent military strategist. Uh, he never lost a military campaign. There's no record in the scriptures of King David ever losing a military campaign. So when you read those first 28 verses, you discover that God came down in nature and actually fought for David on the battlefield. That's what all that stuff is talking about. It's talking about brimstone, okay? It's talking about uh, brimstone and hail and earthquakes and fire and smoke and the uh, waters coming up, the earth breaking up and springs of water coming up and uh, thunder in the heavens. And all that is God coming through nature. And that is not the first time we've seen God do that. God did that same thing for the children of Israel when he delivered them from Egypt. He used the 10 plagues of Egypt. They were, most of them were from nature, frogs and lice, but he also turned rivers to blood, uh, rivers of water into blood, but he also made hailstones fall from the sky. So that's not the first time we've seen God do that. So the point of all those verses is God showing us how he will fight for us. He will actually use nature to fight for us. And that's something that a lot of people these days don't know how to take advantage of. They don't know that when you worship God, he will show up and fight for you. But he doesn't metaphorically fight for you. He literally fights for you. That's what all those verses were about. God showing up through nature, through whirlwinds and earthquakes and water coming up, and hailstones, and fire, and thunder, and lightning. So when David was on the battlefield, he didn't lose, <coughs> excuse me, because the God of heaven was fighting for him, okay? And again, that's not the first time we've seen God do that. That's how he delivered the nation of Israel from, from Pharaoh, okay? And when Joshua, the successor to Moses, fought, uh, Joshua fought a battle in the valley, Joshua spoke to the son, and told the sun to stand still. And God honored that, and God made the sun stand, stand still. And scientists have found that there's a day in history where the earth didn't rotate around the sun, and they point to that day where Joshua 
made the sun stand still because he said, I need sunlight so I can keep fighting. I don't need the sun to go down. I don't want to fight at night. And God heard that. So the reason that kind of stuff is in the Bible, because if God did it for them, he'll do it for us because God doesn't change. It's to encourage you to faith, to understand that God fighting for you is a very real thing. Because King David says here, watch these verses. Psalm 18, uh, four and five, listen to this. He said, the sorrows of death compassed me and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. That is not metaphor and that is not allegory, okay? David said, I was surrounded by a bunch of ungodly people. The sorrows of hell compassed me about the snares of death prevented me. And what that means is that David thought it was over. David thought, I'm going to die. David thought they're going to kill me. They're going to take me out. They're, 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 they're too much for me. I can't fight this by myself. But David called upon the Lord and God showed up and fought for him. Okay. So that's the background of that psalm. And there's so much more I could say because those verses are literally action packed. But what we want to focus on is voc uh, verse 29, because there's more verses we're going to look at as well in other books of the Bible. What we want to focus on is verse 29. For by thee I have run through a troop, and by my God have I leaped over a wall. Okay. Part of that prophetic promise is physical strength. You can claim supernatural physical strength to get done what God is trying to get you to do. Did you know that? That's how Abraham could father a child at the age of 100. Because his body had died, meaning he was not sexually uh, potent, sexually capable anymore. He could not make love anymore. And God recharged his body. Sarah, his wife, was 90 years old, which means she was way past menopause. She was way past having any eggs left. And God somehow gave her an egg or preserved an egg that turned into Isaac. And that couple had a baby. Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90. That's a physical miracle. That's not metaphor. That's not allegory. That's literal. And so what the Bible is saying there is that you need to learn how to claim your supernatural physical strength to do the will of God. That God calls David when he said he'd run through a troop. In other words, David was up against a whole bunch of people and he fought his way through them. That's not the first time in the Bible we've seen that because Samson did that. Samson killed a thousand men with the jawbone of an ass or a donkey. OK, and it's physical strength, that's physical anointing. Moses was 120 years old when he died. Moses was climbing mountains. Now, President Jimmy Carter just turned 94 or 95. That's the age range Moses was in when he did all the stuff he's famous for. He did everything he's famous for between the ages of 80 and 120. Moses, that's right. He was climbing Mount Sinai, an old man climbing a mountain to meet God face to face and write down everything God was saying. That's how we got the first five books of the Bible. Do you understand that? So the Bible is telling you that God will give you supernatural physical strength. The Bible is telling you that God will deliver you physically from your enemies. You could be a, in a crowd of enemies and call upon the Lord and somehow, somehow God will fight for you. So you must remember, you must understand that everything in the kingdom of God is appropriated by faith. And what that means is that God puts it in the word and then you have to read the word and or somebody has to preach or prophesy or teach the word to you so you can hear it. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And as you receive the teaching of what the word says, you begin to believe it and incorporate it into your life. And so King David is saying, that he had the physical strength to leap over a wall. He had the physical strength to run through a troop and God came down and fought his enemies for him because he was surrounded and he would have been defeated had he tried to fight them on his own. So the next time you get in trouble, you must remember this scripture. You must remember Psalm 18, one through 29, that you can call on God <clears throat> and watch God show up and fight for you and watch God show up and give you physical power to do what you need to do. But there's more scriptures because there's more out of that word leap we need to get. So now we're going to look at Acts 3 and 8. And this is uh, encompassing a lot of what the Holy Ghost wants me to say about what we're doing now, the time that we're in. 
Okay. Now, Acts 3 and 8, now that's another one where I need to read verses leading up to it so you can get the context. If you're familiar with this Bible story, it's a very familiar story, but if you've never heard it before, I'm not assuming that you have, so I'm going to read it. Okay. Acts, uh, now the book of Acts, if you don't know what that is, the book of Acts is what happened right after Jesus left. So the first chapter of Acts start, starts with the Lord's last days on earth. He told them what to do, and then he ascended back up into heaven. So in other words, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are about Jesus' birth, his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, and then 40 more days after his resurrection. The book of Acts is about what they did after Jesus went back to heaven and how they began to organize the early church. Okay, that's what the book of Acts is about. Yeah, the word Acts is short for Acts of the Apostles, but most people really understand the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles, okay? Because the book of Acts is where the Holy Ghost falls and comes to indwell us as believers, okay? So Acts chapter three, verse one. Now, Peter and John, two of the people closest to Jesus, okay? His inner circle, Peter the fisherman <clears throat> and John <clears throat> was much younger. He was the one that laid his head on Jesus' chest at the Last Supper the one that Jesus loved and the one that Jesus trusted his mother Mary with. That's John. Now, Peter and John went up together. John also wrote the big book of Revelation. Now, Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Alms are like uh, homeless people asking for change, asking for food. Uh, this man me, being lame means he couldn't walk. He was born crippled. And so every day they carried him to the gate of the temple and the name of that gate was called Beautiful. And he, he was asking people to give him money and food. So he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple and asked in alms. And Peter, fasting his eyes upon him with John said, look on us. And the man gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping, there's our word again, he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. Now, there is another example in the Bible of God giving physical strength to people that were crippled. This man was born crippled. He had never walked in his life. And he thought that Peter and John was going to give him some food or some money or some change. And Peter and John looked on him. And they told him, look upon us. And they said, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. But then Peter grabbed him. And that's what I'm going to focus on. So first, there's another example of getting physical strength to do, to be healed. But look right here. <clears throat> Verse 7, Acts 3, 7. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. I realized I did not put my scriptures on the screen. So the first one we did, Psalm 1829. So I'm just putting them on the screen now for those that might be coming late. So I went through Psalm 1829, and what I'm reading now is Acts 3. Seven and eight. So what I want to focus on in those verses is not just the physical part, but this is what the Holy Ghost is trying to say. There's something or someone about to come in your life. I don't know who this is for, but whoever's listening to me right now, there's someone that's about to come in your life that's going to take you by the right hand. Now, the right hand is always important in scripture because the right hand signifies the hand of power the hand of favor, the hand of grace, the hand of justification. Jesus is on the right side of Father God. 
And what that means is that Jesus is on the side of your defense. Jesus is not on the side of condemnation. In other words, Jesus is not the prosecuting attorney. The devil is the one that comes to accuse you before God, but Jesus is the defense attorney at the right hand of God saying that you are justified by his death, burial, and his blood and your faith in that blood. He's there to defend you because he paid the price for your sins and you don't have to pay for the same thing twice. Okay, so the right hand in the Bible is always very significant. So people, Peter grabbed him by the right hand and lifted him up. You know what that's talking about? That's talking about mentorship. That's talking about favor. That's talking about somebody coming in your life, giving you a boost, giving you a glow up, taking you to the next level, introducing something to you that you could not have attained on your own. OK, I don't know who that's for, but that's about to happen in your life. Took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Now, what you need to understand there is, first of all, don't be listening to these people saying that God can't deliver you like that because it can. God took a man that had been crippled his whole life. And the Bible says immediately. If the Bible says immediately, if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for you. If God did it for him, it'll do it for you. He said immediately his feet and ankle bones, that's physical, that's not metaphor. His feet and ankle bones, which were the crippled part of him that he never walked on because your ankles and your feet, your ankles and your feet are what support your body weight. And he never walked in his whole life. That means there wasn't any time for his brain or his feet or his ankles to adjust to the fact that he was walking. The Bible says immediately, that means it just happened. His feet and ankle bones received strength. What that means in a spiritual sense and what the Holy Ghost wants me to exegete from that in a spiritual sense is that you might all of a sudden get strengthened in the area you've been weak in your whole life. Good God Almighty. I'm getting blessed by this myself. I'm going to watch this video myself. The Holy Ghost is saying that when that person comes in your life, you are about to get deliverance in an area that you've been crippled in your whole life. Know what that means? Let me give you some examples of what that looks like. Let's say you struggle with love your whole life. You weren't loved when you were young or you were abused when you were young or your mother and your father didn't do what they were supposed to do. Or maybe they died and you were just an orphan. OK, maybe you have lacked love your whole life. God's about to send somebody in your life who immediately going to turn it around. You're going to use love and muscles that you've never used. That's what that means. Uh, let's say it's family. Let's say you felt alone your whole life. Let's say, uh, let's say your whole life you felt by yourself. Let's say your whole life you have felt like you were alone, like you were a loner. Let's say your whole life you felt like no one understood you. Let's say your whole life you felt like you were out here by yourself. God is about to send somebody in your life that all of a sudden immediately is going to help you realize that you are not alone and you're never going to be alone again. And you're going to use muscles that you have never used. And it's not going to be like no three and four years. <laughs> it's going to be immediately. Let me give you another example. Money. Let's say you struggle with money your whole life. Let's say you've been bad with money your whole life. Let's say you've been broke your whole life. God is about to send some finances in your life that are going to give you strength in the area of your finances. And you're going to use financial muscles that you have never used before. So the lesson in this particular passage of scripture is, number one, don't refuse somebody's right hand when they're reaching out to your right hand to give you a boost up. Don't slap it away. That includes God, by the way. If God is reaching out to you directly, it doesn't have to be a mentor. If God is reaching out to you directly to give you a glow up, don't slap his hand away and reach out with your right hand, the hand of your strength, so God can establish you. But also, it don't have to take no long time. It doesn't have to take a long time. It doesn't have to take a long time. It can happen immediately. Your life can change just like that. You know how I know that's true? Because tragedy can strike just like that. Tragedy can strike just like that. You don't see it coming. And the next thing you know, something didn't happen that you didn't see coming and it happened like that. Okay. If tragedy can strike like that, blessing can strike like that too. Remember, remember 
we're in the game. We're we got a choice between life and death, blessing or cursing, good or evil. Both can happen. So don't have so much faith in tragedy. Don't have so much shock when tragic things happen that you lose faith in good things happening the same way because they can happen the same way. And you can immediately use muscles. I don't care how old you are. If you're a teenager in your 30s, in your 50s, in your 70s, 80s, 90s, you can immediately get up. Immediately get up and use muscles that you have never used before. That's straight from the Holy Ghost because I feel the anointing flowing while I'm talking. So I don't know who that's for, but it's blessing me. So Acts 3, 7. Took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones receive strength. His feet and ankle bo bones, that's your support system. Those are the bones that support your body. Immediately you get support. They received strength. They received strength. They received strength, okay? Because Peter and John gave that man what they had. They added their faith to his. They knew they had the healing power of Jesus. They knew they had the name of Jesus and they gave that man what they had. But look at the next verse, verse eight. And he leaping up, there's that word again. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Now wait just a minute. We are talking about a man that had never walked in his life. That means he didn't know what walking was. Did you catch that? If you've been blind your whole life and you have surgery and they take the bandages off, that's the first time you're seeing. You don't know what seeing is. Seeing is new. Okay? The Bible is telling you right there that that man went from never having walked in his life to leaping and walking and praising God. He leaping up. So in other words, he didn't just stand up. He leaped up. He jumped up. So that means your rise can be sudden. And just like uh, when the people saw him walking and praising God, they knew it was him. We sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened to him. That's how people are going to react. If you have a glow up and it's all of a sudden and it looks like it comes out of nowhere, people are going to be like, is that so-and-so? You know, just out of nowhere, are you doing this thing that God has given you supernatural divine strength to do. And it says that uh, he's leaping up, stood. He stood on his feet. That's the first time in his life he stood up. So in other words, his feet and his ankle bones didn't have time to adjust. It just happened and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. He entered with them into the temple. Now, do you understand that that crippled man had never been in the temple? The Bible says they laid him at the gate of the temple. The name of the gate was beautiful. They laid that man at the gate. That man had never been in the temple. What does that mean? That means that God is about to send you into some place that you have never been. Maybe you've been laying at the gate, crippled your whole life. You never made it in. God is about to give you strength and jump you up and help you get in something that you've been laying around or outside of your whole life. Your whole life. Good God Almighty. Your whole life. You never entered in it. Now you're about to go in it for the first time in your life. And you're going to leap in. And you're going to walk. And you're going to do something you never did before. That man had never walked before. Do you understand that? That's why I can't <clears throat> stress that enough that he put one foot in front of the other like he'd been walking his whole life. And that's the first time in his days he'd walked. And what that means when people see you doing this new thing that you're doing, you know, if they knew from before, if they knew you from before, they're going to be like, who is that? But the people that are meeting you for the first time are going to just assume it's always been that way. They just, just, you know, because they don't have a frame of reference. They don't know what you come from. Okay. But he walked, entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And the last thing I'm going to say about this one is when God does this for you, open your mouth. Open your mouth and give him glory. Give him the glory that's due his name. Open your mouth and give him praise. Don't sit there with your jaws tight when God does a miracle like this for you. Open your mouth and praise him in public and private or wherever. Okay. Now we've got a few more scriptures and I'll be done. 
The next scripture we want to look at, that one is still burning inside my soul, I tell you what. Next scripture we want to look at is uh, Isaiah 35 and 6. Isaiah 35 and 6. Isaiah is one of the major prophets of the Old Testament. As you've heard me say many times, major prophets does not mean their message was more important. Major prophets means their books were longer. Okay, so Isaiah wrote a lot, over 60 chapters in the book of Isaiah. Jeremiah wrote a lot, but Habakkuk, Malachi, uh, Jonah, Micah, their books are small, four and five chapters. That does not mean their message is not important. It just means their books weren't as long. So when you hear that phrase, major prophet, that's what it means. It means they wrote a lot, not their message was more important. Okay, so Isaiah chapter 35, verse 6. Uh, New Living Translation, the, the lame will leap like a deer, and those who cannot speak will sing for joy. Springs will gush forth in the wilderness, and streams will water the wasteland. New International Version, then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. Brian Study Bible, then the lame will leap like a deer, and the mute tongue will shout for joy. For waters will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. There's that word leap again. What are we going to get out of that verse? Uh, what that is talking about, just to give you background context, is God is talking about how he's going to restore Zion or the city of his glory or the city of the Israelites, the holy city. Because Isaiah and Jeremiah were talking about the destruction of the city because the people had disobeyed God and got taken into captivity and the city got torn down. Isaiah was prophesying about how one day God was going to restore all that. And so what Isaiah is, say, Isaiah is saying here is that the lame will leap like a deer. That's the same thing we just read in the book of Acts. That's not just metaphor. That's literal. That people that are crippled are going to get up and walk. And they're not just going to get up and walk. They're going to jump like this. They're going to spring. They're going to hop. They're going to leap. And then it says the mute tongue will shout for joy. People that haven't been able to speak are going to sing and shout. For waters will gush forth in the wilderness. What does that mean? That means that God's provision in what was previously a dry place will be so great that it's going to make you, even if you couldn't talk before, it's going to make you talk and sing. Springs will gush forth in the wilderness. The wilderness represents a dry, barren desert place, and streams will water the wasteland. That means that God's provision is going to burst forth like watering streams, and that's going to make you leap. Okay? All right, and the last one I want to read is Malachi 4.2. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. Uh, now, the way the Old Testament is laid out, you have to study the chronology because you can't tell by the order of the books, like who was alive when. Because uh, like Nehemiah and Ezra were contemporaries of Esther and uh, Malachi was in there too. So Malachi is not chronologically the last book that happened but it's the last book in the order of the New Testament in terms of the King James order. So that's a whole nother thing. So Malachi chapter four, verse two, a new living translation, but for you who, oh, wait a minute, I need to put that on the screen. I didn't put Isaiah up, did I? Okay, wait, let me put Isaiah 35 and six because I wanna be sure that those that watch this video, you can go to the scriptures. So I just got through talking about Isaiah 35 and six. And now I am in Malachi 4 and 2. Okay, Malachi 4 and 2. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will, ri will rise with healing in his wings, and you will go free, leaping with joy like calves let out to pasture. New International Version. But for you who revere my name, the son of righteous righteousness will rise with healing in its rays, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Berean Study Bible, but for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go out and leap like calves from the stall. There's that word leap again. Now, what are we supposed to get out of that verse from the Holy Ghost? First thing that I want you to see out of that verse is that the first thing the Lord says is, but for you who revere my name, okay? The Lord is trying to contrast. If you read the book of Malachi, you understand that God is basically giving his nation of Israel a list of all the stuff they did wrong. Malachi is the one that said, shall a man rob God? Wherein have we robbed thee? They asked the Lord. The Lord said, you robbed me in tithes and offerings. 
So God, see, this is just like Revelation 2 and 3. That's why I try to tell people, God gives you grades. It's just like being in school. God gives you academic grades. So you remember at the end of the semester, you got your report card and you got some A's or maybe some B's or maybe some D's. Maybe there's some classes you totally failed. Maybe you just got a C average. You remember that? Remember that when you're in academic school? The Bible does the same thing. God does the same thing for our lives. He gives you grades. That's why it is foolish for you to live your whole life and you never ask the Lord, what is my, what are my grades? How am I doing? That's how you end up like the people in Matthew 7 who just assume that you know the Lord. And you just assume that you're in the kingdom. And you just assume you're going to get in and you stand before the Lord and the Lord shakes his head and says, get out of my face. I never knew you. Why would you wait till after you die to have that experience? It's because you never ask God to give you your grades. That is one of the functions of being a Christian. That's one of the things that the Lord is doing from heaven now. But he did it in the Old Testament too. That's what the book of Malachi is about. God is giving Israel a list of all the stuff they did wrong, the stuff they need to get in check, the things they need to repent of. So God says here, the first thing this verse says is, but for those of you that fear my name, and that's important because you have to understand that means the promise is conditional. You know how for years now I've been preaching against genie concept. Okay. God is not a genie. You don't just go before the Lord. You don't go before God and tell him what to do. You don't go before God and just pop your fingers and order up some stuff like he's a genie. No, 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 no. Uh, we bow down before God. He don't bow down before us. We follow God. He don't follow us. Okay. We obey God. He don't obey us. So you have to go before the Lord and ask. You don't go before the Lord and tell. So God is saying here that this promise is conditional. He's talking about for those that fear his name. That means this is not going to happen for those that don't. So you can't be one of those Christians, one of those people that has no fear of God and think that this applies to you. You can't just live any kind of way you want to and then think you're going to get the blessing of God. It doesn't work that way. The blessings of God comes on those that believe, those at HBO, you hear me say it all the time, those that hear his word, those that believe his word, and those that obey his word. That's three things you got to do. You got to hear it, you got to believe it, you got to obey it. Then that's when the promises kick in, okay? And so many people, there's been so much bad teaching. That's why you think God took his mighty hand and tore down all that stuff we was doing in church? Because we have had too much bad teaching, <clears throat> excuse me, that has taught people that you get the fullness of God just because you're a Christian. That's not the truth. You get eternal life because you got saved. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You're justified. Your sins are forgiven. Uh, you are just right with God. God, Father God sees you through the eyes of Christ. You have access to his grace. There's a lot of benefits that you get just for being saved because God is a good God. But if you want to move on to the fullness of everything that God has for you, both in this life and the life to come, you have to hear, believe, and obey. You can't just accept Jesus as Savior. You have to accept him as Lord. You can't get saved and then just do what you want to do and think that God is going to honor that or give you the full blessing. It's not going to happen. And you might die early. You might die before your time. There's a lot of Christians that die before their time. Do you know why? Because, not because they weren't saved, but because they were disobedient. Is that really true, Prophet Taylor? Yes, it is. That's what happened to Samson in the Bible. God told Samson before he was born, God told his parents to, he was not going to drink any wine or strong drink. So Samson was not supposed to be lit. He was not going to let a razor come on his head. He was never supposed to cut his hair. And God also told him that he was not supposed to get involved with Philistine women. Samson disobeyed all that because Samson was spoiled. And Samson had all kind of women on his side. And then he got involved with Delilah. And Delilah, Delilah was a prostitute. They paid Delilah to get the secret of Samson's strength from him. And when Samson told her all that, then they cut, she cut his head. And that's how he got powerless before the Philistines. And then they captured him. Then they blinded him, poked his eyes out. Then he ended up dying early. Samson did went through all that because he disobeyed. He didn't have no business. Tell, he didn't have no business with Delilah. She was a Philistine. He was supposed to marry a Jewish woman. He was not supposed to be with her. He wasn't supposed to be sleeping with her. So yes, your disobedience can cause premature death. There are not enough people who say that. So I'm going to say it. <laughs> your disobedience can cause premature death. You can't just live any kind of way you want to. 
You got to hear, believe, and obey God to get the fullness. But the good news is, when you do hear and believe and obey God, then the promises kick in. So God said, but for those of you who fear my name, revere my name. Uh, and just as an aside, the fear of God has lifted off America as a nation. That's why people are so crazy. And that's why people are just doing all kinds of stuff that you never thought you'd see in your lifetime is because the fear of God has departed from this nation. And when that happens, people get crazy. And when that happens, eventually worse and worse judgments fall. So that's why God said, you better learn how to fear, honor, revere means to honor me. Okay. Understand the awesomeness of who you're dealing with. But for those of you who revere my name, those of you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. Uh, that is one of my favorite phrases in the whole Bible. The son of righteousness shall rise with healing. And some translations say its wings. Some translations say his wings. Some translations uh, write the son, <clears throat> S-U-N. And some translations write the son, S-U-N, but the S is capital. When the S is capital, a capital S-U-N, son of righteousness, and the R is capital, like in the New Living Translation, that's talking about Jesus. That's what that, That's another metaphor for Christ. The son of righteousness is talking about the son of God rises with healing in his wings. That means as God flies towards you, he comes towards you with healing. Do you know how I know that's true? I just felt it this week. I just felt it when I was on a prayer call and I felt the Lord open up an anointing of healing and I felt the power flow into my body. And I felt it go throughout my body. I physically felt it because the Lord opened up a treasure of healing. That's how I know it's true. Remember, I always tell you, I'm not out here preaching and teaching and prophesying anything that I'm not living myself. I know that verse is true because I just experienced it three and four days ago. I felt the Lord open up that healing. I felt my body get strength. I felt strong. I felt whole. I wasn't tired. I felt like I got a boost, a rejuvenation. That's how I know this is true. That's why I tell you all the time, don't be listening to people to tell you that the Bible isn't real. Don't be listening to people that tell you that the Bible is old, ancient, archaic, it's not relevant. That's not true. It's real and living is right now. You can live it every day. So this verse about the son of righteousness arising with healing in his wings, I just felt it. I'm not making that up. Okay? It's real. But for you who fear my name, and I do fear his name, the son of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings, and you will go free. Stop. If you got to go free, that means been bound. It says you go free, leaping with joy like calves let out to pasture or calves let out from the stall. Well, what does that mean in plain English? It means in plain English that sometimes if you've ever been on a farm, you've seen how they hold the cows and the bulls. And sometimes the way they hold the cows and the bulls is, and they do it with horses too. They have individual stalls, metal stalls that they hold them in and for whatever they're going to use the animals for. But uh, when they go out to eat, when they're going to eat from the pasture, they let them out of those cages and they go out there and run free. That's what the Bible's talking about, is that if you've been in a, in a stall or you've been in a cage, you're going to get let out. That means if you've been in bondage, if you've been encaged in any way, God is about to let you out and the healing in his wings are going to set you free. And then you're going to leap. There's that word again. Leap with joy like calves let out to pasture. So in other words, the same way, and you can see it with lions. I just watched some videos about lions that got let out of uh, circus cages. You can see it with dogs. You can see it with animals that have been caged up their whole life. When they get let out to where the grass is, they start running around. God said, that's what your experience is going to be like. And let me say this a little bit and I'll be through. Because the Holy Ghost gave me this to say. What the Spirit of God is trying to convey to us through all these verses about leaping and about being free is about how God wants to break you free into a new dimension and a new level, new pasture, new water, and he wants to break you free from the old, okay? But he wants you to not despise it. Don't be afraid of it. And here's the thing. Sometimes, like the man at the beautiful gate, Sometimes you got to make a leap of faith. What does a leap of faith? That's a very common phrase we use, making a leap of faith. But what does that mean? That means that you got to go for it. 
what do I mean? If somebody gave you a chance to be on national TV tomorrow and do what you do, and it came out of nowhere, whatever it is that you do, uh, if you're an author, if you're a singer, if you're a dancer, if you're a speaker, whatever it is you do. What if somebody came up to you tomorrow and said, you know what? I got a start on my TV show. We're going to put you on national TV and the whole world going to see like that young lady that got to speak her poem at the inauguration of President Biden, Vice President uh, Harris. And that lady got a chance to get up there and speak. Uh, I forgot her name, but she got up there, got up there a chance to read her poem. And the whole world knew who she was like that. If the door opens, you got to go for it. That's what. What if somebody said that to you tomorrow? Now, I know some people don't want fame. Some people don't want fame. Some people don't want the cameras. But what if you got a chance that came out of nowhere and all of a sudden somebody just saw you and said, you know what? I'm going to put you in a movie. You look like the, the person I've been looking for. We're going to give you this movie role. And all of a sudden, uh, that's what happened to Katie Holmes, by the way. Katie Holmes uh, sent in her audition tape for Dawson's Creek, and they liked her so much they told her to come out to Los Angeles immediately. She said she couldn't because she wanted to graduate, and she was working on a play in her high school. So you know what they did? They suspended the taping of Dawson's Creek to let Katie Holmes graduate because they wanted her for Joey Potter so bad. Katie Holmes went from being in high school to being on a national TV show, and everybody knew who she was. The same thing happened to Alva Levine. Alva Levine was going to high school in Canada, and then she got the record contract and she made her videos and they released uh, Skater Boy. And she said over the weekend, she went from being a girl in high school to everybody knowing who she was because they blasted them videos out. It can happen. And that's just, you know, in the area of the arts, you know, acting and, uh, and uh, music. But what if it happens with what you do? Whatever it is that you do. What if somebody said tomorrow, tomorrow, President Biden has called a council and he needs somebody to speak to him on this subject, and I'm gonna put you on a council. Don't think that can happen because that's what happened to Joseph in the Bible. Joseph was in jail on a false rape accusation. And he had told his fellow inmates, when you get out, don't forget me, and they forgot him. Joseph didn't deserve to be in jail. Potiphar's wife tried to sleep with Joseph and Joseph said no. And Joseph said no so hard, Joseph ran out of his clothes to avoid having sex with that man's wife. She accused him of rape and they threw Joseph in jail. Joseph was in jail on a false rape accusation. Pharaoh had a dream. Pharaoh called all the wise men in his cabinet that he knew they could not interpret the dream. And then one of the inmates said, oh yeah, I was in prison with this guy and he does dream interpretation. And then Pharaoh said, well, go get that man because I need to understand this dream. They went and told Joseph that Pharaoh was calling for you and Joseph shaved himself, washed himself, took a shower, put on some fresh clothes and stood before Pharaoh and interpreted his dream. And Pharaoh was so pleased with Joseph's dream interpretation ability that he put Joseph in charge of the entire economy of Egypt. And Joseph went from prison to the palace in one day. So don't tell me it can't happen. It can happen, okay? It's going to happen for somebody listening to this broadcast right now. God's going to put you in a situation, but when he does, you've got to go for it. You can't be he be the hobby, be 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 You can't be that. If you meet somebody and they say hi, and you think they're cute, say hi. You're up there trying to play hard to get, trying to act all like you. <laughs> you don't want to be missing a relationship because you you playing mind games. If President Biden calls for a council and you get a chance to make a presentation, to the president of the United States, don't be he but a hobbit. Talking about, well, yeah, but what am I supposed to do? What do you mean what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to do what you do, that's what. If somebody told you tomorrow, we're gonna let you sing the national anthem. And, and you know, if, they, if they're if they doing baseball because football is over, or they're doing basketball or whatever, and they said, well, we heard you sing, so we want you to come sing the national anthem. If they give you a shot like that, take your shot. But the Holy Ghost is telling me to say that Sometimes you got to leap. So in other words, you here, an opportunity is here, and you got to do this right here. You got to jump. <laughs> so you all the way over here, but the opportunity is here. So you see the opportunity here, that door open, but you here, all it was saying, you might have to do that right there. Get all bionic with it. Okay? You might have to do like Batman. You shoot that grapple going and 
and swing on over. Man, do like Spider Man, shoot the web, swing on over, do like the Hulk. You bend down, you leap on over. That's what. That's what you got to go for it. How many times in life do you think a door like that gonna open? One more time. How many times in life do you think a door like that will open? You you can't afford to be he did what am I supposed to do? But he but he but he that's all, folks. No. When the door opens, you got to go for it. You got to leap. Okay. I have been in situations like that. I have been in just to give you a brief example. I was in a situation one time where I was at a school, and at the school, they told me over and over and over again, do not prophesy. Do not prophesy. This was a Christian school, but they don't prophesy because they're like, the head of the school don't like that. They don't like prophets coming in, just doing their thing. They don't, they don't, you know, get authorizations to prophesy. You can't just walk in there and start. So they said, whatever you do, David, don't be up there trying to prophesy. I was like, fine. I will shut my mouth because I ain't got no problem shutting my mouth. Believe me when I tell you that. I got up in class. The teacher said, who are you? I said, well, my name is David Taylor. She's like, what do you do? I'm like, I'm an author. I'm a prophet. I'm a songwriter. She said, oh, you're a prophet, huh? I said, yes, I am. She said, all right, well, prophesy what you got to say. <laughs> That caught me so off guard, but I opened my mouth. I said, Holy Ghost, don't fail me now. I didn't say feet don't fail me now. I said, Holy Ghost, don't fail me now. I opened my mouth and I let the word of the Lord come out. And everybody that saw that was astonished because they were like, I know she didn't just let him prophesy, but she did. She just met me. And everybody told me, you can't do that. And then she stood me in front of the class and said, okay, open your mouth and prophesy. She basically said, let's see what you got. And I, and I didn't have time to him and haul and he but a hobbit. I had to call on the Holy Ghost. I was like, like, Lord, you tell me what to say and let the word of God come out my mouth. And I ended up prophesying to uh, again in that same space. After all them people told me, you can't do that, David. You can't do that. Just don't, just don't even think about it. After all that, that's what happened. That's not the only time in my life that's happened, by the way. I'm just giving you a quick example to let you know about how you can get thrust into a situation where, again, opportunities over here and you over here and you got to eh, 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 that. That's what's coming for somebody listening to this broadcast. That's what's coming. Don't be surprised if tomorrow President Biden is calling for you. Don't be surprised if tomorrow Oprah is calling for you. Don't be surprised if tomorrow they want to put you on national TV. Don't be surprised if tomorrow you, you don't about know who you are. And then the president of your company say, you're going to make a presentation to the board, the top board, okay? Like the, the, the people that run everything of a multi-billion dollar company, we're going to bring you in and you're going to speak. To the chief people of the company, do not be surprised. That's what's coming for somebody, okay? And that's what the Holy Ghost wanted me to say, that when that door opens, whatever you do, leap through it. Sometimes you've got to Go for it. What if you was about to meet your wife and you just didn't go over there and say, say hi? All you had to do was go over there and say hi and start a conversation. What if you about to meet your husband and all you had to do was go say hi? I will forever remind you that Boaz did not pursue Ruth per se. Boaz asked questions about who she was and tried to find out who she was. But to, for them to actually get married, Ruth pursued Boaz and Ruth went to where he was sleeping on the threshing room floor and stayed at the foot of his bed all night. And when Boaz woke up in the middle of the night, here's this woman there at the foot of his bed. That's how they got together. Ruth did something and she did it in the middle of the night. And Boaz like, we got to get you out here for the day breaks because it can't be known that a woman came on the threshing room floor because women weren't allowed on the threshing room floor. Ruth took a chance. Ruth put it all on the line. She said, I want you to redeem me. You're my kinsman redeemer. I want to be married to you. That's why they got married. Okay. Ruth went for it. In other words, that's what I'm trying to say. She went for it. The door opened and she went for it. So, so let's recap. Uh, and then we'll do prayer requests and then I'll be done. The Holy Ghost is saying the prophetic word is leap. That God will physically give you strength. God will physically fight your enemies for you. God will get you out of situations that are too much for you. God is going to send someone in your life to extend to you the right hand. 
and you grab it with your right hand, it's going to give you strength to get up and do something you've never done before in your life. And it's something you've been sitting around your whole life. You about to go in, in that, that, that when the son of righteousness arrives, the Lord is going to bring healing with him. And it's like, it's going to be like a baby cow let out of a stall. You're going to run around in the pasture. There's going to be so much water and so much grass. And you're going to be running around leaping and, and, and praising God. And finally, the Holy Ghost says, if the opportunity opens up and it's some ways from you, you're going to have to leap to it. You have to go for it. You can't be sitting around and heave it a hobbit or what should I do? Okay. And that's a prophetic word for today. Now, I got blessed by that myself. So bless God. Now, if you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen. If anything you want me to pray for, put it on the screen right now. Otherwise, I'm going to wrap up. Now, remember I told you uh, every time I do a video, also, let me put my cell up. If you want to bless my ministry financially, um, I heard allegedly, did you hear me say allegedly? Uh, I heard allegedly that Cash App was doing not good things with money. So I stopped using Cash App altogether. So I started using Zelle. And there are no fees on Zelle either way. So if you want to bless me financially, please send it uh, through my Zelle. I just put that in the chat. And, uh, oh, my sister is uh, praying out to get a seed sown. Amen, amen, amen. So thank you, sis. Thank you for those well wishes. So there's my Zell that's on the screen. That's my personal email. So uh, if anything you want me to pray for, put it on the screen. So, um, so yeah, so the thing that I want you to do this week is this week, I'm doing uh, my No More Genies because No More Genies comes on the second Thursday of every month. I want you to tune in on No More Genies. It's going to be this Thursday at 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. I'm going to put that on the screen. No More Genies Thursday. What I want you to do for me this week is watch the No More Genies. And I want you to share it in as many places as you can. And here's the reason why. On my No More Genies, what I am doing is I started a new series where we're going to go back to basics. We're going to go back to foundation. We're going to do some basic stuff about being a Christian and some stuff that is not really done and hasn't been done, at least on some areas in church. And so I need as many people as possible to see that video because we're going to do some foundational stuff. We're starting off with with deep diving into who God is and what the scripture says and really learning God for yourself, because that's what we're supposed to do. So I already did uh, my first No More Genies on that, Who Is God, part one. So I think it's going to be about four parts. So this Thursday, I'm doing No More Genies, part two, Who Is God, part two. So what I want you to do for me this week is tune in Thursday. So put a, a reminder on your calendar, on your Google calendar, whatever you use to, uh, Tune in Thursday, 7 o'clock p.m., and I will alert you in the group chat on Facebook. And then I want you to share that video because we want as many people as possible that don't have any kind of foundation. That's what this teaching is. It's foundation. You don't want to be one of those Christians that lived your whole life and never really got to know the Lord. Because the Lord already told us that means that your life's not going to count. So what you want to do is you want to be sure that you know God for yourself. That's what this teaching is. So what I want you to do for me this week is watch No More Genies on Thursday, 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time, and share that video as many places as you can, because it's foundation teaching, and that's what we're doing now, okay? All right, I don't see any prayer requests. My sister has a general prayer request, uh, okay? All right, so uh, that's it. Uh, thank you so much. So I'll be here Thursday, 7 o'clock p.m. on Facebook, Central Standard Time for No More Genies, Who Is God, Part 2. And I'll be back next Sunday, uh, so, uh, 2 30 p.m. Central Standard Time, uh, March 14th, for the next weekly live prophetic word. So let's give God some glory. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your name, oh God. We bless your name, God. We worship you. We thank you. We exalt you. We magnify you. We give you all the glory and the praise of God. We thank you for the visitation of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, oh God, for your prophetic word. We thank you for your written word, oh God. We don't take anything for granted, but we bless your name for showing up. And, and honoring us during this time. We worship you and we give you thanks. And we know that you will fight for our enemies and give us strength and give us opportunities and take us, Lord, from where we were and set us free and bring us into a new and a large place. And we thank you, we believe you for it. And signs and wonders and miracles are gonna follow this word. 
thank you, and I believe you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Amen and amen. I will see you Thursday, and then I'll see you next Sunday. God bless. Have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week.